I would like to welcome Dr. Ramesh Mathur sir, Senior Vice President and Head of Vaccines Research and Development at Biological Limited from over seven years. After completing his Master's in Microbiology from Osmania University, Dr. Ramesh Mathur sir holds a PhD degree in Biochemistry from University of Mysore and worked as a postdoctoral fellow on Molecular Biology and Biochemistry at Michigan State University and then at Ohio State University Biotechnology Center on lung, on lung Infections by Opportunistic Pathogens in Immunocompromised Host. Internationally, he is experienced working with people from USA, Europe and India, extending his research in bacterial and viral vaccines. He returned to India after 18 years career in biotechnology in the USA and immediately out to returning to US with Yet Research, an American pharmaceutical company in New York. Dr. Rami sir serves on the editorial review board of the Journal of Industrial Microbiology and Biotechnology published by Springer. He has 22 publications and 8 patents. Now I would request Dr. Ramesh Mathis sir only enlighten us on today's topic. Okay. Thank you, Al Alina. Uh, Welcome, sir. Thanks for a long introduction that was not needed or really. Um, but uh, I would first, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank everyone for joining and then trying to listen to what's happening in the COVID-19 vaccine development and also some background on the vaccines for infectious diseases. Uh, one, at the outset, I would like to correct the date today. I just, this morning, I was typing that 24th July 2020, but it somehow, you know, finger typing 2014 came as, but it is 2020. Um, I also would like to thank KIT, Alina, and Bayrak, and all other people who sponsored make this event you know, possible. Uh, the, my purpose of, of taking up you know, this presentation is to educate young and experienced people in whatever way, if we could um, provide a new information in this uh, vaccines area, then my purpose of uh, spending time on this uh, seminar you know, is uh, fulfilled. So again, you know, thank you all. I just wanted to give a brief introduction on the infectious diseases and then how the vaccines are developed. In general, vaccines compared to other biotherapeutic proteins or protein-based therapeutics, uh, they're very different in the sense that every vaccine contains an antigen. That antigen has to trigger an immune response. It's a strong immune response. Whereas for therapeutic, proteins like MAPS and other therapeutic proteins, you should not see any immune response to the, to the uh, drug that is you know, administered. So that's a fundamental difference between monoclonal antibody-based therapies and the vaccines. So they both are at the two ends of the spectrum, uh, just for the outset. And then if you look at the different infectious diseases, on, the, on my slide here, it shows the different uh, agents, infectious agents, bacteria, virus, um, that are, have been known for a very long time. And this is not a full exhaustive list, but this is a good representation, of, good representation of all the infectious agents that every newborn and then every adult at one time or the other faces come, comes across. And um, if you look at the, in the first uh, you know, uh, box in Clostridium tetany, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, these are all the uh, infections caused by the bacteria. And there is a huge uh, burden on infants uh, after childbirth survival up to their you know, second birthday or fifth birthday. So there is a high infant mortality because of these bacterial infections. So the governments have introduced uh, public immunization programs to protect the children or the infants uh, from their birth till they reach the adulthood by administering these vaccines. The bacterial vaccines and, and the, some of these viral vaccines, they protect the, uh, the infant uh, from these diseases uh, before they, their immune system uh, fully developed. 
But some of the challenges in these things are the, the uh, vaccines until recent times, for example, salmonella typhi, streptococcus pneumonia infections, there was no good vaccine to protect uh, children like toddlers or even infants. Uh, however, the conjugate vaccines were introduced uh, in, in the past maybe five, 10 years. But in India, they are not, uh, they are in a private market, but they're not widely available to uh, all. So there is a program from the Indian government to, to make them available. Similarly, the measles, mumps, and hepatitis B, uh, all these are all you know, viral vaccines. They're all uh, part of our current uh, ongoing uh, government immunization program. So every infant gets a uh, particular schedule, dosage schedule. So if you move into uh, these traditional vaccines and known vaccines, uh, the the emerging ones are, and everybody knows these days, the, the Ebola, Zika virus, SARS, MERS, and others are known. And uh, the latest one is the SARS-CoV-2. So this is just a uh, the, try to give a broad, good, you know, broad uh, picture overview of the infectious uh, diseases and the vaccines development. Some of them have been known for a very long time. Some are emerging. And for some, still work needs to be done. So the, the challenge for all these vaccines, uh, they, they do not follow the same uh, path. So every the infectious agent is different in terms of causing its, you know, the disease. The mechanism is different. The way it runs through the body then causes, you know, um, uh, damage to the, to the host is different. So in order to design a right vaccine, there are different, you know, uh, technologies or, or, or ways they have to be you know, developed. These, if, I, if you look at, one looks at all the, what are the different kinds of vaccines, antigens are developed. They all, you know, uh, all over the board, meaning different, uh, not the same thing works for all, same you know, technology side. However, if you look at the, the what are the different kinds, like uh, six or seven, uh, recombinants of unit vaccine where a part of the, the organism is cloned, for example, a protein, or a, a cloned and expressed in, uh, in E. coli or some other you know, organism, not the native pathogen. That's the recombinants of unit vaccine. Sometimes the protein is isolated from the pathogenic organism itself, demanding the, requ or the requirement to grow the uh, pathogenic organism in a large bioreactor and purify the protein from it. Uh, the best example is a pertussis vaccine. Uh, Azil or pertussis also, some of the antigens that are used are recombinant. Some of them are produced, purified from the uh, pathogenic organism. So in this um, uh, slide, we see the spectrum of antigens. The, they go some chiral, chimeric viral vaccines, wherein uh, uh, the vaccine strain is modified in such a way to carry a fusion protein and different um, recombinantly modified antigen display. And the other example is the VLP, virus-like particles, where the uh, virus shell is manufactured without the nucleic acid inside it. So that virus uh, structural um, the, the part of the virus can generate a strong immunity and then cause the you know, uh, protection to the host, whereas there is no harm because the VLP virus-like particle cannot multiply, cannot cause a disease. And the examples of them are like, for example, like hepatitis B, surface antigen, and human papilloma virus vaccine that causes cervical cancer. Those both are approved, they're all in the market. The other example is live attenuated vac viral vaccines. For example, if you take measles virus and uh, mumps or rubella, they're all you know, pathogenic strains, but they were adapted in such a way that they do not cause a disease, but they can grow in the, in the uh, host once they are administered. So that's one strategy because they can trigger a good, strong immune response without causing a uh, true disease. And the latest two technologies, the bottom two hexagonal, they are shown, nucleic acid vaccines. You see that more and more on the COVID uh, uh, vaccines are, you know, COVID-2 vaccine uh, development because nucleic acids are the latest technology that is being developed and, and you know, uh, there's very promising uh, the news is all over in the in every you know, news channel. 
and the recent one is a polysaccharide protein conjugate vaccines that two vac three or four are already on the market typhoid pneumococcal conjugate vaccine and meningococcal vaccine and hib also hemophilus influenza type b vaccine so they take a polysaccharide and then conjugate that with a, a protein that triggers the immune response in infants infant's immune system uh, is not fully developed uh, to to uh, generate antibodies to the polysaccharides on this bacteria so when the polysaccharide is chemically attached to to a protein that is called an a carrier protein and the protein polysaccharide is called a chemically conjugated and administered as a vaccine you know antigen and that can trigger a good protective immune response in infants so that's the strategy that was developed that was the one that are already in the market so basically if you select an antigen how do you decide that antigen has to be how it is to be administered you require a formulation in the formulation also you have to have an adjuvant you have to make a decision whether you need an adjuvant like aluminum phosphate or aluminum hydroxide uh, or you don't need an adjuvant at all so these are all the different decision making steps when uh, a, a company or a team works on developing a vaccine and uh, the latest other formulations are all called liposomes and uh, liquid form or sometimes a vaccine is a freeze dried just a powder freeze dried and then just before the injection to the to the subject it is mixed with water or a buffer and then sort made a suspension of that so the vaccine is a vaccine sub generally administered in three different ways intramuscular subcutaneous or intranasal uh, intranasal is you know for example so one of the flu vaccine is the best example and all uh, vaccines they get injected and um, coming to the vaccine antigens once you understand the principle of the vaccines and so how do you manufacture them so as i mentioned uh, e coli or a pseudomonas for example are the two uh, hosts where the foreign protein antigens in this case are expressed and then major work cars is e coli or yeast these days a uh, very few cases where pseudomonas could be used or was used and uh, when you express them in e coli i think most of the you know, people you know who are working in molecular biology how they recombinant proteins are expressed in yeast and in e coli and purified when it comes to yeast so when you express an antigen you also have to watch out for sometimes it gets glycosylated whether it has to be secreted outside the cell or it is made inside the cell and mammalian cells are mostly used are different cell lines again and that for the manufacture of the viral vaccines certain viruses grow very well in certain cell lines and uh, insect cells are also one example where baclovirus expression vector is used to, to express the vaccine antigen Uh, so these are different uh, platform cells when it comes to certain uh, cases where a whole virus is used for example a rabies virus it's a highly pathogenic and it requires a highly contained facility because even though the vaccine strain it has to be inactivated there is no uh, strain uh, live attenuated strain for rabies for example in case of measles and mumps you have live attenuated strain but comes to Uh, or rabies virus nothing like that the pathogenic virus strain is grown in in the, in the facility and then it's chemically inactivated and then there are certain ways of you know measuring the inactivation and uh, in case of for example some of the bacterial vaccines in case of or diphtheria you have to grow the pathogenic organism that makes this toxin and that toxin is chemically Uh, inactivated by exposing to formaldehyde for example and then there is a way to measure how it is fully inactivated you test it and then it goes into formation for making the drug product the challenge here is again facilities if you have to grow uh, the and manufacture the rabies virus you need a dedicated facility other than rabies virus you cannot grow anything else um in case of uh, e coli for example recombinant vaccines manufacturing Uh, on a campaign basis, uh, you can change uh, one antigen or one vaccine to another vaccine. Whereas in case of rabies, it is very difficult. Uh, so that requires a dedicated facility. That means there is a heavy investment goes for each product. And coming to the vaccine development stages, as I just mentioned, once you identify an, a vaccine antigen, 
you have to demonstrate whether it's immunogenic and it is safe. So if you look at the, the uh, box in the, in the first box, what you have to say show is it is uh, you test the formulated antigen. That means before you formulate an antigen, you should know how to manufacture it or meaning you know, produce it, purify it, set all the quality standards and um, purity check. Then you make into a formulation and then start testing it in, in the uh, lab animals like mice, rats and rabbits. So in this process, you, what you do is you test your formulated antigen, the, the amount of antigen that has to go, go per dose and number of doses. And once you are, while you're doing this, you also have to monitor the antibody titers and then, then correlates of immune protection, whether it's meeting that or not. And then it's an iterative process. You don't do it just once, you have to do it multiple times and then make sure that, yes, in animals, targeted, you know, representative animals, your vaccine antigen, formulated antigen is generating a good immune response. And then that response would give enough confidence that it can protect uh, the, the, the subject from the infection by the infectious agent. So once you have demonstrated that, then the next step is uh, test your formulation through again government agency and approvals in adults. Demonstrate in, because adults can you know, uh, tolerate if there is an issue, safety and emergency has to be demonstrated in adults. And once you demonstrate that, again, look at the data, is it working as expected? But once you or decide it is, it is working the same way, then move into toddlers. Toddlers are about, you know, about two years or five years and then test them. And in that group, and then once it is established and then finally you go into infants and then you, there also you have to show safety and efficacy of the vaccine. So this is a long drawn process of developing a vaccine. If you are targeting, protecting, uh, uh, if you want to protect infants or toddlers and so on. So the purpose of this whole thing is every infant needs to be protected so that the, the, the child grows into a full grown adult and then uh, you know, fully lifelong protected by the, 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 uh, protected by the vaccines uh, against the infectious agents. So while this is going on, there is also in the field, there's maternal immunization because sometimes infants are born, when the child is born, the infant for six months could be vulnerable uh, or the maternal antibodies transferred to the infant might fade away. So there is a, a growing body of you know, the effort going on uh, vaccinating uh, mothers before the delivery, three months, the first or second trimester and so on. So, but that requires a lot of safety uh, parameters have to be you know, evaluated. And this slide, uh, vaccine, again, typical timelines I show, uh, this involves the more or less the same steps I just described, from discovering an antigen all the way to go to the extreme end marketing authorization applications or national regulatory agency licensure. Um, just for people to understand, again, proof of concept in animals, it takes at least, these are all very aggressive timelines, meaning these are the shortest possible timelines. If everything is known, the infectious agent is known, correlates of protection are known. Every, if a company wants to start making a vaccine, this is the minimum time it takes, four to eight years. Proof of concept in animals, about six to 12 months, because you have to decide on the platform to manufacture, the, set the quality standards and so on. Preclinical development is safety uh, evaluation, demonstration in animals. And there are governmental uh, guidelines, uh, Indian government guidelines are there, as well as the, the WHO and FDA, how to do a preclinical evaluation for safety and uh, emergency in animals before you go into adult humans. Usually when you go to the, this is called a phase one, phase two and phase three stages of clinical trials. Safety in adults is usually it's done in small number of subjects. And then we, with the government approval, you go that again, depending on the, the, the vaccine, it might take six to 12 months. So before you men go from preclinical development to uh, uh, safety in, and immunogenicity in humans, the one critical requirement here is uh, manufacture your vaccine under GMP conditions. And then 
quality control, quality assurance have to be established. Then your vaccine would be sent to a government lab in India that gets um, released after testing for your quality components. And then only the product can be approved, gets approval for um, safety and emergency. Again, your clinical trial design, the protocol will be reviewed by Indian government. And then CT stands for clinical trial approvals. And then the review process and approval of your application varies, duration varies. So this overall 48 years timeline includes all these uh, events, you know, your ability to manufacture the vaccine, set a, uh, show the proof of concept, and then design a clinical trial, government review, go conduct a study, come back with iterative process, and then uh, go into phase two studies where more number of subjects are tested, more than 100 subjects. This also again takes six to 12 months. And here you show safety and efficacy with a comparator. If there is, if you're developing a vaccine similar to something that is already on the market, you have to use that as a comparator to show that your vaccine is as good as the one that is already approved and on the market. Same process goes into phase three, but in a phase three, it would be a much larger scale. Meaning at this stage from phase two to phase three, when you want to move, your vaccine manufacturer capability should be at the commercial scale that you intend to manufacture if the assuming that your vaccine gets approved for, for commercial authorization. So this process also again goes into you know, manufacturing. Here, every manufacturing process has to be validated. Every quality assay has to be validated. Every method has to be validated, meaning there is a different requirement in you know, that's a quality parameter. So again, this is a time-taking process. And uh, usually phase three trials are done more than thousand subjects or several thousands. Typically the, the aggressive timelines are again one to one and a half years. Sometimes it takes two to three years. And then once you go through a phase three, submit all the data, safety, efficacy, non-inferiority with the comparator, if the comparator makes sense, and then go for the, your local government uh, approval to market uh, the, the vaccine. And their review process could take at least six to 12 months. And after that, if you want to supply the vaccine to WHO, World Health Organization, or UNICEF, they would come and then pre-qualify, meaning they would uh, look at all your manufacturing capabilities and the GMP manufacturing facility, and your quality control procedures are you know, up to their standards. And then once they are satisfied, they can you know, approve or to, for the UNICEF to procure the vaccine from the vaccine manufacturer. This is just a, in a nutshell of what happens in a vaccine manufacturer large scale. So coming to SARS and CoV-2, given these requirements on developing a vaccine uh, to take it through all the different, different stages, uh, this SARS, if you, if you recall one of my earlier slides uh, listed out Zika, Ebola, and those vac the viruses, the SARS came out as a complete surprise. But um, interestingly, what happened is there is an international body of scientists, um, different you know, organizations have been uh, guessing or, or assuming or they're predicting, I would say, there could be a pandemic situation, but they do not know which organism, which um, virus could cause a pandemic. Uh, 10, 12 years ago, there's a MERS in the Middle East, SARS was there again in China, and also swine flu, uh, all these you know, experiences were there. So based on that, they were predicting that something could happen like this. Let us be prepared, vaccines uh, to be developed, not necessarily just vaccines to be developed, but there should be a good um, ability to manufacture in a mass scale to address a pandemic. While those discussions were going on, and SAP is an organization that, uh, you know, uh, intergovernmental funding, and including WHO, uh, US agencies of different governments have been funding uh, to, to address or set up a uh, facility or a bodies to address these pandemic situations. But they did not know what the SARS is going to come and jump at us. November to December, I believe, in China, the whole thing started. And the news was out in December, into January, uh, then the lot of Chinese uh, scientists started, they isolated the virus, they sequenced, they, they grew, they sequenced what the virus was, 
and then they identified that as a SARS, you know, virus family, this coronavirus family, and uh, the genome sequence was published. I, interestingly, it was uh, very clear from the beginning that that is, uh, well, it is a coronavirus, but it is different from COV-1 that was you know, discovered or that caused the disease in 2003, 2004, around the time. So again, while this is happening, March 2020, finally, uh, WHO declared this as a pandemic situation. So by then, it went out of control. So SARS-CoV-2, again, uh, the, some background everybody knows. Uh, this is one of the, the, the or it not one, I should say, it's a very unique virus, whole world, uh, more educated on vaccines today than you know, uh, six months or 10 months ago because of the virus. And then the way it was spreading all over the world. It's highly contagious. It uh, multiplies in the upper respiratory tract, and then disseminates itself very easily. That's the biggest difference from previous uh, viruses that are, that attack the respiratory system. And the virus pathophysiology was not known. This is an evolving information. The everyone you know, in the world globally putting an effort in understanding how the uh, virus is causing the disease, and then it's. Um, target protein was known, like a to receptor and so on. However, in this case, the virus is attacking multiple organs, lungs, heart, kidney, you name it. It's, it's all over the, the body. And that created a biggest challenge for, for the, the medical professionals to treat, what to treat with, as well as uh, to understand and then come back with, for the vaccinologists to understand, come back with a proposal to how to develop a vaccine. And this has all been happening and all simultaneously. If you recall, January of this year, today is July, within six to seven months, uh, there's so much damage is done, but uh, entire vaccine knowledgeists and then scientific communities stepped up to use the, whatever the current technologies or uh, tools they have uh, being diverted to develop a most you know, a safe and efficacious vaccine for COVID-2. The challenge here again is a no, uh, to develop a vaccine, you need to have a, some kind of an animal model, but there are no animal models readily available, meaning that everything has to be developed and then it has to be done in a very short time. I think this is a very highly contagious virus, need a BSL-3 facility to study the virus, grow the virus and so on. So these are all the challenges for, uh, for the manufacturers or the research labs to set up. Again, um, SARS-CoV-1 disease mechanism was known, but CoV-2 is very different in virulence. In the, 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 the degree of pathogenicity is very different. Uh, and uh, based on the earlier SARS virus, the coronavirus, there is, uh, it's known that the spike protein could be the one that would be entry into the cells by binding to the ACE2 receptor and so on. But the ability of this spike protein binding with the ACE2 receptor is very different from the earlier virus. So that, even though it's known a target, but to understand this modified protein and the design properly for eliciting, to properly to use it as an antigen to elicit immune response was critical. So again, you need to understand the protein, express this protein and understand the mechanistic uh, details of the protein. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. <clears throat> the <clears throat> receptor bind domain, the fusion domain, <clears throat> are the potential antigens. <clears throat> so the <clears throat> coming back to the genome sequence, the, the virus genome sequence was published. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> not enough information on the protective antigens. Spike protein is the only one that is known. <clears throat> Then the in vitro assays for vaccine efficacy, pseudovirus neutralization assay was needed, but fortunately that was available in the scientific community globally. And then people have used, adapted that for, to address the uh, curve to case. Again, the challenges are 
in this case correlates of protection is not known and to design a clinical trial number of subjects in the trial that is one thing people have to uh, decide and any trial you plan you have to have a filter which is inclusion and exclusion criteria what are the subjects that's again a debate antibody titers this is the is the biggest thing in this case because this virus is known to generate a lot of antibodies but which uh, kind of antibodies what type of antibodies are protective meaning um, the virus could trigger immune response but the only some small percent of antibodies that are generated by the body they help prevent the infection and so how do you identify those not they are not necessarily antibodies but uh, the antigens that trigger those are kind of antibodies that's the very critical thing in developing selecting an antigen developing a vaccine test for virus neutralization that's need to be also needed using such antibodies and definition defining clinical endpoints that is another challenge for a clinical trial okay. you inject the antigen uh, you look for it how do you show that these this is the cutoff levels or these are the measures if the you you achieve you can declare your vaccine is working you can even vaccine can protect uh, against the infection by cov2 so one of those things is you know you can look at the fall rise in neutralizing antibodies not necessarily total antibodies but neutralizing antibodies that that means you have to develop the <clears throat> right assets to monitor that one and the other uh, demand is efficacy trials efficacy trials are the ones you vaccinate a large population and then watch out for uh, how many of them get infected with the the virus compared to unvaccinated number of subjects then this kind of trials take involve uh, thousands and thousands of subjects and then takes some time to to come close the study so yes it will be. so these are the typical challenges for you know, covid-19 again vaccine formulation do you want to have one antigen or more what kind of adjuvant you would like to have a number of doses and then how do you deliver it so when i said the delivery this is this again depends on the formulation you use <coughs> lipid nanoparticles um, nucleic acids or protein antigens using the traditional adjuvants these are all the different uh, things that could go into formulation so the formulation also will dictate the delivery uh, how it is delivered <coughs> so this slide i just wanted to just, uh, give some background information on uh, debate that has been going on on for covid vaccine for clinical development uh, most of the, the the debate is you know there is by a prominent or eminent scientists in the field uh, everybody knows i guess dr fauci and dr collins at nih and uh, the the paper i just wanted to show what they were saying is protection from infection is defined as zero conversion and the prevention of clinical symptomatic disease these are the two uh, immunological end points for vaccine development traditionally or even in this case also you cannot just uh, you know change rules here however you could relax some uh, requirements but the 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 end point or meeting the end points uh, that is cannot be compromised because that's what defines <clears throat> the efficacy of the vaccine so while this is going on the people also scientific community has been working on developing uh, uh, or selecting a right animal model so syrian hamsters have been were identified as suitable models for infection challenge with doctor post vaccination so challenge is in the sense you vaccinate the the animal with your vaccine and then wait for immune immune response once you see the immune response in the animal post you know two doses or three doses whatever it is and then you challenge the animal with the true virus and then virus has to replicate in this animal if it is not vaccinated so you have two groups compare them what is how many of them survive and some uh, how many of them cannot survive that's how you evaluate your vaccine and at the same time we also have to look at the reactivity of the vaccine antigens the one uses in your in your vaccine 
this is uh, another uh, publication on how and what's and you know, vaccine reactogens and how do you define a react reactogenicity. This represents again physical manifestation of the inflammatory response to vaccination and other uh, injections like pain, redness. These are very uh, routine and common uh, adverse uh, effects, which is uh, injection site pain, redness, swelling. These are very most of the vaccines do give this, but they are not very major. However, the major ones could be uh, something called, in this case, antibody dependent uh, enhancement of the disease, meaning once uh, a person is exposed to have certain kinds of antibodies against the antigen, we need to make sure those antibodies are not, in my terminology, they are not rogue antibodies, meaning those antibodies should not help when uh, the subject uh, is uh, exposed to the virus, help the virus to infect the uh, subject. So there are certain cases like that happened earlier, many years ago, on the respiratory essential virus. Uh, it happened in 1960s or, or mid 60s, where inactivated virus was used as as a, a vaccine antigen, and then they saw uh, more number of infections in a vaccinated population than unvaccinated population. So there was some and then some adverse events were there also. So that time they there was a ban on conducting whole virus uh, vaccination for RSV. In case of dengue, very recently, the similar things were there for serotype 2. If people who are already exposed have antibodies against serotype 2 or type 2 of dengue virus, if they get reinfected, the disease enhancement will be much stronger and then uh, it's more damaging. So these are called you know, uh, adverse antibody dependent enhancement of the disease. So in this case, uh, also some uh, one has to address that issue as part of establishing safety of the vaccine. So these are the, the, the three uh, circles that show or address the different uh, various factors in the vaccine development. And the, this is a very critical individual experience during the, you know, and after vaccination for establishing a safety. The, some of the safety risk factors are, you know, age, gender. Some in some cases, you know, ethnicity or, or background you know, uh, uh, underlying uh, this the, the health uh, conditions, and uh, this administration factors also are the ones that has to be kept in mind. So again, safety of a vaccine. How do you do this? Is, <clears throat> as I mentioned, antibody dependent enhanced enhanced disease uh, needs to be addressed. That it's not there for the antigens that you're using and concern is similar to dengue itself. The challenge here is this can be addressed, ADE can be addressed, however you need time, but the world needs vaccine in less than one year, it is reported. So everyone is expecting a vaccine to be available by September, the last quarter of this year, between September and December of 2020. So this is a little bit difficult to show safety in a short time. However, there are you know, companies that are putting uh, enough effort to demonstrate safety. And interestingly, many of the COVID-19 survivors showed different degrees of lung damage and uh, scar tissue, lung fibrosis. This is uh, another issue where uh, if they get reinfected or a vaccine is, they get exposed to the virus, what could happen is the concern. And many of the survivors also show low titers of antibodies. That's also a little bit puzzling. This is uh, the, the publication to demonstrate what uh, it means by antibody binding and enhanced viral infusion. For example, uh, how the antibodies uh, prevent the virus from, from causing the disease uh, in, a, in a vaccinated individual. So antibodies would bind uh, the virus particle and then this forms a complex. Anytime a complex is formed, your white blood cells or macrophages would come in and clear it up. And the, the, the way mechanism of uh, antibody binding the virus in you know, different ways are there. Uh, it would interfere with uh, spike protein binding to the receptor, how it can happen, uh, keeping the virus completely away. Or on the site of uh, interaction, the antibody comes and um, interferes with the, between the virus and the cell surface. Um, sorry. And uh, in, the, in the third uh, category is where, this is where the concern is. Sometimes the way the antibody binds uh, and it um, uh, directly 
the, the virus is directly you not know, taken inside the cell uh, without going through a phagosome or a lysosome. So that's the concern uh, here. The another paper you know, published by Dr. Barney Kaim from NIH or NIAID is the, the response of the vaccine. You need to select uh, the antigen, the right antigen in the right confirmation. Uh, that's very critical. If the spike protein is taken and used as a vaccine, uh, it might trigger undesired uh, effects in the body. And then it might say, uh, for example, the, the, it's called a Th2 cell or base response, bias response versus Th1. So meaning the, the something, another term called a cytokine storm. The cytokine storm is the one that uh, triggers the uh, body to uh, have very rapid, strong uh, allergic in inflammation and try to deal with the, the infection. But in the process, it could damage itself. That's the biggest concern. So the, this table it clearly shows you know, the mechanism of the antigen, how it, it, it can form, and then what kind of uh, T cell mediated response. Uh, to mitigate that, all these concerns, I would like to focus on the bottom line. The mitigation is you one has to use confirmationally correct antigen and high quality that would generate high quality neutralizing antibody. And that will, you know, the Th1 biased immunization and its CD8 plus T cells uh, generation uh, uh, is what uh, is required. So this factor, this uh, requirement is factored in selecting the antigen and its confirmation and the quality of it. While this is going on, um, so typically all the government uh, agencies like FDA or in India, DCGI and so on, they have their own set of requirements in review process and approving a vaccine. That takes years. However, since the, there is an urgency in developing a COVID vaccine, and then going through the traditional road takes much longer time. And uh, so different international bodies came together and then put some recommendations on how fast you could develop this vaccine. Generally, what happens is that the government agencies are not really worried about uh, how soon, uh, uh, how fast a company can develop a vaccine. It is in the best interest of the company to develop a vaccine for their business interests. But in this case, COVID-19, it is a public interest. It's a pandemic situation. They have to come and then give proactively some guidelines and guidance to, to the companies. Say that, OK, you follow this, 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 and then these are our requirements. Maybe we could review faster in a short time while keeping the safety in mind, bring a vaccine uh, sooner to the market, uh, while you continue to deliver or work on your committed requirements on to show the you know, safety and efficacy in parallel. So they put some guidelines. It's called the R&D blueprint from WHO. And then FDA also re released some guidance to the industry in June 2020. This is unprecedented. Something like this, to my knowledge, never happened before. But this time, all the public private uh, agencies, you know, parties coming together, working on uh, developing or facilitating the development of a vaccine in the shortest time. This paper I just took out uh, to make people understand uh, what the major difference between SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2, the uh, spike protein uh, uh, ability to generate the antibodies. Or in other words, the the Antibodies against the CoV-2 RBD, RBD stands for the receptor binding domain, and how they can uh, interact or, or recognize the epitopes on these um, viruses and on these spike protein in a similar manner. Meaning the, the spike protein of CoV-1 and CoV-2, they are 70% or 75% uh, homologous. There is a 25 or 27 percent uh, difference is there, but that <clears throat> difference is also focused on the region where the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor and the cells. 
and then facilitates the, the viral entry. So the antibody is generated against Cov2 RBD. The sorry, the the the, per, the people who survived the Cov2 infection were screened, and then some antibodies were were isolated, purified, and then they were given these designations. And then the 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 Cov2 survivors uh, uh, antibodies, how well they were able to recognize uh, the RBD receptor binding domains of CoV-1 and a CoV-2. So if you really look at on the CoV-2 RBD antibodies, they can, if you look at this OD, the ability to bind the versus, versus the dilution, even at this you know, 10 to the 2 or 10 to the 3 dilution, they're still effective for these antibodies. When it comes to CoV-1, they're completely uh, not, not very uh, much you know, affinity. And this is on the ability to bind in ELISA. The other assay they have done is neutralizing the virus, meaning the, the uh, preventing the virus infecting the cells with the same antibodies. Look at here, against CoV-2 antibodies, it can prevent effectively. When it um, comes to CoV-1, the, the efficacy of the antibodies is completely you know, lower. So the, this clearly tells that the, the uh, SARS-CoV-1 RBD may not be a good antigen to protect against SARS-CoV-2 RBD, basically. And the other way to design your vaccine is if you have, if you isolated the neutralizing antibodies and then find the epitope, epitope is a part on the protein in which it triggers the immune response meaning the neutralizing antibodies can be used in a reverse way to find what region of the protein uh, generates those neutralizing antibodies so that that particular region of the protein can be incorporated in your vaccine to get a good immune response and an efficacious immune response. So this is one way of uh, finding uh, or selecting an antigen by isolating the neutralizing antibodies and then testing them the, and identifying the binding site on the particular antigen, and then go back and then use that as a, a part of your vaccine formulation. Interestingly, there are a lot of antibodies are generated by CoV-2. However, only a small proportion of those antibodies are neutralizing. Um, Uh, interestingly, this misleading thing is when we are using a neutralizing uh, pseudovirus neutralization assay, all these junk antibodies interfere and then prevent, give a false uh, um, opinion to the, to the researcher that they are also protective. But in fact, um, uh, the, the uh, response, if you look at the new, based on the neutralizing antibody epitopes, is slightly different. So these are all different nuances, uh, minute details that uh, researchers uh, have to understand, develop, and design the particular antigen properly so that the vaccine would be efficacious. So these are all things would take some time. Uh, so while this is going on, this in this paper, uh, it is uh, on a high level uh, demonstration that the, the cytokine storm gets initiated by interleukin-6. If this IL-6 is stimulated wrongly in this case, that can trigger a good, uh, very strong uh, immune response. So the indirect evidence for this is there are certain uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, that go and block this uh, IL-6, prevent the formation of IL-6, and then uh, another uh, next level in the pathway uh, to prevent these uh, uh, these uh, intermediates in the pathway. So this is one way to prevent for the treatment the uh, medical community is using. So if you really look at uh, the different um, ways of addressing or different uh, drugs or molecules are in development, Many of them are vaccines, and half of them are, you know, 40, 50 of them are monoclonal antibodies that were already approved uh, 
different um, indication could be repurposed for covid-19 one of the recent there is one uh, approval from you know indian biotech company in bangalore to to address this uh, the for a potential therapy is also there so um, these are on the bottom line these are the different um, uh, cytokines that when they get triggered because the root the, the high level regulatory trigger point is interleukin 6 that triggers all other cytokine different cytokines are you know, listed here they all interfere with uh, allergy and inflammation cause that so to coming to the to the, uh, the current status where different kinds of uh, vaccine antigens are in development for covid uh, one of them is you know whole virus inactivated uh, inactivated covid and then adenovirus exposed exposing the spike protein and the same spike protein or some other antigens uh, exposed on measles and other uh, vaccine strains of other viruses chimeric viruses and nucleic acids everybody knows uh, the companies that are there uh, in different advanced stages of clinical trials and uh, again vlps the trimeric spike protein as a particles delivery receptor binding domain adjuvanted on or absorbed onto aluminum hydroxide or aluminum phosphate and so on and some peptides are also which potentially trigger immune response to block the virus uh, infection so these i just put only few categories representative of different ones but uh, there are there are looks like 140 different um, uh, vaccines are in development if you look at the who site uh, it's listed out however 24 candidates are in clinical trials today so the the whole uh, vaccine community in the world many companies are working on developing a vaccine uh, uh, with their own versions and these are all various formulations contain different types of known adjuvants also being tested some of these adjuvants are first time uh, usually an adjuvant is the one that would enhance the immune response for an uh, for uh, an antigen so or any time an adjuvant test will be tested it cannot be tested on its own but it has to be tested with some adjuvant that is also going on so it's a very dynamic situation in uh, in terms of clinical development of a vaccines for covid 19 this slide i just put together because once a vaccine is approved what's the next so the governments and then would buy it and then use it for mass immunization of their population that's the intention they want to because this virus uh, does not discriminate by age or, or gender or or a region or a country nothing it's the you know, everybody globally needs this vaccine but who administers this vaccine mostly the governments or private market depending on the country where the vaccine is made available typically the vaccines in a country like india are low income middle income countries or low to middle income countries all these ones are classification that uh, uh, made by unicef and other parties india falls in one of those um, categories and so indian government and the many nations developing world asia and you know, asia pacific uh, many countries buy the vaccines and then administer them, make them available to their public however the challenge would be when there are different kinds of vaccine this is my uh, based on my experience i'm just putting out uh, in, in a slide potentially there could be challenging because uh, there are three or four different kinds of vaccine but they all protect against the covid-19 uh, governments will have a challenge in finding which is the right one to procure and then continuous supply so hundreds of millions of doses should be there and some challenges they are going to face potentially but this is inevitable this is going to happen anyway but this is something to watch out wherein the equivalency if the number of doses are there they have to administer the schedule like a two dose or three dose they cannot swap and substitute another vaccine one vaccine with another vaccine 
that is possible for the current some of the current vaccines that are you know approved because those vaccines are identical almost with from irrespective of the manufacturer but in case of covid that may not be the thing so that's the potential challenge even though it's a good situation to be in because government would have more than one vaccine for a pandemic disease however there should be challenge which one to select procure and so on so uh, with this i would like to close my presentation we are all waiting for uh, a vaccine uh, with high confidence in scientific communities and governments so that this vaccine would be accessible and affordable globally with that i would like to close my presentation thank you all alina sir can... for then yes sir yes sir so thank you sir for the enlightening enlightenment and interesting talk and uh, many of our participants would have queries and uh, would be happy if uh, sir could answer few of the queries now sure so shall we proceed yes sir yeah so uh, we so we can take the questions available online first and uh, meanwhile we can also take the questions which have been asked by participants while registration so first question which we can take is from ms priyanka and her question is some companies have clubbed phase 1 and phase 2 clinical trials for the current development of vaccines so could you uh, could you elaborate on how it is done sir okay the phase 1 and the phase 2 are clubbed meaning um see with the the phase the purpose of phase 1 is to show demand demonstrate the safety so you can traditionally you demand the safety and going to phase 2 for example however if the safety aspect of the vaccine is very well demonstrated if this uh, the, there's more confidence that uh, safety is not the major concern for example and then you could go into you know club phase 1 and phase 2 however phase 1 and phase 2 is not club it could be staged meaning uh if you have recruit if you if you it, it all depends on your clinical trial design and if you have selected lay say for example proposed 100 subjects you are going to you know vaccinate and then look for it even this 100 would they receive one dose or two doses for example and uh, you give the first dose and then wait for any adverse events and then go to the next administer the next dose uh that's one way the other thing is to to see the the number of subjects uh, it's you give both the doses to 10 subjects and then if you have not found any uh, issue with it you go spread on to the other uh, expanded to the remaining subjects so it all depends on a clinical trial design that again depends on the vaccine formulation and uh, the amount of safety data that is generated before uh, uh, phase 1 is proposed so it's a little bit more subjective but there is a, it's not uh, straight forward that uh, we would just combine phase 1 and phase 2 usually what they do is phase 1 safety in 20 subjects or 30 subjects and then show it is safe and it is efficacious also and then you go into phase 2 slash 3 what they call or just one phase 2 um, or if they combine phase 1 and 2 they have other plans to do a phase 3 also so it it's a little bit of subject to it all depends on how you design your clinical trial discussing with the regulators and mainly dictated by your vaccine uh, formulation antigen and a formulation the uh, next question is from mr aregitu is from kit school of biotechnology and he has he has a couple of questions and his first question is what type of vaccine is covid 19 vaccine means is it a live attenuated or killed vaccine kid killed vaccine or uh, conjugated vaccine so he wants to know that what type of vaccine covid 19 vaccine can be it could be anything that meaning uh, there are several versions are in clinical trials 
Uh, some of them are slightly advanced. Some of them are catching up. Uh, that's a, that's this. We have to wait and see. There is uh, uh, no guaranteed uh, predictable situation. Uh, reason is, if you look at adenovirus expressed um, uh, spike protein you know, vaccine, uh, there there are two, three, four companies are there uh, working on, and uh, they all have shown that uh, the virus that, that formation can generate uh, protecting neutralizing antibodies. But the titers are not great. We don't know that what it means. For example, so that's why they are getting into efficacy trials. If you look at Moderna, the nucleic acid-based uh, vaccine, they are saying after two or three doses, they are showing a you know, good amount of uh, neutralizing titers. Again, for all these things, the benchmark is people who survived uh, COVID-19 infection. What levels of antibodies they have, and the vaccine should have one notch or two or three times above uh, those antibody titers in the vaccinees. So these are all different criteria. So it, it's difficult to predict who's going to you know, come to the market first, but multiple of, multiples of them will come. So he has uh, one more question. That mm -hmm. question is, the if the vaccine is attenuated or hit killed, so how is attenuated uh, um, virulence reduced. Okay, this is this is, this question not name may not be necessarily for a COVID nineteen in general. There are ways yes. uh, of measles. For example, you, you take a classical example of measles virus. Measles virus it causes a disease. So, but the the current vaccines are called a live attenuated. So the attenuation happens by repeated passage of the virus strain in, through certain cell lines and then looking for uh, loss of virulence, but ability to multiply. This, uh, these things have been very well established in classical virology books, for example, or uh, many years ago, in, in all these things have been established. Uh, so that's why these called uh, virus uh, strains have certain names. There is uh, the sometimes even the lab or the, or the person that uh, isolate these uh, develop these strains by repeated passage in a lab and then test in animals and then show that it is safe, and so on. So in case of measles, I just give the strains names. You know, uh, there is a strain called Schwartz strain. There is another one called Edmonston strain. Uh, Edmonston Zagreb. That Zagreb is uh, the city or the location in in Europe where the, the, the strain was isolated. And uh, the, these virus uh, strains, vaccine strains, carry the name of the researcher that worked and isolated those ones. So in Japan have their own uh, virus strain. Uh, Europe has their own, for example, in the US they developed. So this is the process that uh, when there is a measles is a more of a, it was a pandemic also. Just for, for people to understand one, one uh, important point here, <laughs> the ability of COVID-19 to infect, they're called R factor, it is like a three or four, for example. But when it comes to measles, measles is even, even more highly contagious than COVID. The R number is much higher. I think, I believe it's 18 or something. Um, so things like this is not uncommon. Somebody would come and then develop a uh, vaccine. In case of COVID-19, developing an attenuated, live attenuated, it's it's a little bit of a, a difficult thing because this virus attacks literally every organ in the body, and then there is a little information is known on its pathophysiology. Uh, it is not only just the spike protein. There is more information is coming up on other regions or other parts of the virus could also be targets for a vaccine antigen. Something like a heparin sulfate uh, uh, binding domain on the virus and others are also are there. But uh, for COVID-19, it is a little bit at this point uh, difficult to get a live attenuated. But of course, the heat killed or a chemically killed vaccine uh, is already in development. Four or five companies are developing it. Uh, another question from him is, uh, what cell line is used to produce COVID-19 vaccine? Mini cell what lines. Type of cell line? Yeah, 
covid-19 is uh, this virus can grow in different cell lines you know for example viral cell line is one of them uh, and uh, i believe mrc5 also it can grow uh, but these are the most of the you know cell lines that are people have been using Uh, and the question is from Mr. Mahesh Patel. His question is: Serum Institute has already made millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccine. So, with their collaboration with Oxford, is this their confidence on scientists, or they have taken market risk? <laughs> That's actually there is an answer in his question itself. Um, yeah. So if we all know that it's not been approved yet. but uh, there is uh, some market risk people everybody would take reason is you cannot wait until your vaccine is uh, approved and then you start manufacturing which will take 6 months for example there is no point in it is as, as as we all know as soon as possible the people you know would like to get vaccinated so sometimes you take business risk uh, i believe that's the one thing they have nothing to lose let me put it this way um yeah for not only for a serum it for example any company in that position nothing to lose you manufacture and keep it ready because you may, you you should have of course to begin with you should have a good high confidence in your vaccine and in your clinical trial data the other thing is you take a business risk so the risk would be low in my opinion the uh, next question is from mr chandan kumar he is from pondicherry university and his question is reports suggest that antibody in patients can be there for few months then how vaccine could work how dose can be determined to cope up with this issue yeah that's a good question that we have to wait and see for example uh, nobody knows how long the antibodies would last the reason is this virus is only 7 month old in humans let me put it that way you need, you need time to see how long this uh, protective antibodies would last not only that if a person gets uh, re exposed what is immune response uh, there are a uh, few reports where you know people who tested who recovered again got a infection but uh, there is more we need to wait and see more data on that there are a couple of publications on that also so any time you develop a vaccine you have to as a as a vaccine manufacturer or a developer you have to also generate data on how long the protection lasts so only with the time we can tell because you know everything started only 7 months ago less than one year so we have to wait and see the bus the the, the most important thing first thing is to get vaccinated have enough antibodies so that the herd immunity or or fending off the virus would happen then the virus would if not disappear at least it would get uh, you know localized to a pocket uh yeah that's what it is so <clears throat> the next question is from uh, mr arikitu and his question is uh, as we know nucleic acid vaccine is new technology but its productivity is not much so what is the main drawback sorry what do you mean by productivity is not much can you can you repeat that question vaccine is a new technology productivity is not much so we are saying that uh, the nucleic acid vaccine productivity is not much so what is the main drawback of nucleic acid vaccine i guess his he what he means is productivity means efficacy productivity is um, yes. general generally what we mean is the uh, manufacturability but um, okay we do this is all we are testing it is like someone is writing a story and then 100 people are watching from the shoulder and then what is the next word and next alphabet um it's a challenge uh, the the even the nucleic acid based vaccines or 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 no vaccine through nucleic acid is a new technology first time they are doing it also and they have taken the covid as a, an opportunity and earlier this nucleic acid based technology is to to treat uh, the eliminate the need for monoclonal antibodies for example and uh, now they adapted that for covid and then the first time they are seeing it in some companies depending on the nucleic acid that the mrna or a dna the way it is designed uh, the way it is tweaked also has a greater influence on the immune response 
by nature uh, mrna acts as an uh, you know adjuvant uh, not a human but uh, the uh, synthesized without the methylation groups and so on can act as an adjuvant to trigger a good immune response and the antibodies would come so it's all relative uh, not productive in the sense against what we don't know the benchmark yet so that's why everyone is looking at the benchmark is the the antibody titers on people who survived uh, the covid infection what level of antibodies are there can we match that level same as the person who you know came out of the covid infection is the is the you know point everyone is looking at to compare <clears throat> the next question uh, both the questions are nearly the same so first question is from ms priyanka from naipur mohali and her question is it is known that antibodies generated by active virus last for 2 to 3 months in patients and how can vaccine overcome this challenge and uh, next question is from ms onra das and her question is why is it said that antibody provided in covid vaccine does not cause immunity for a lifetime period rather for a small period of time um it's we have to wait and see this is these are all the questions everybody has for example we don't know the neutralizing antibodies how long they would last uh, with the time again we have to see in, in subject because it's again in only 7 month uh, time period is there um there is the, we also have to don't we should not um or at least let me rephrase it the data available on the the lasting antibodies is not enough to draw a conclusion that these are short lived antibodies or these are long lived antibodies so this information is still evolving this research is going on once that comes into you know uh, there is enough information is there then that, you know people start uh, deciding or, or making decisions or conclusions on that information so it's too early to say it's neither i would not say these la- these antibodies are short lived uh, or would not say that they are long lived it all depends on how you are measuring these antibodies also again in vitro assays are the true representation of the protection in in bodies that there is some gap in that or or there is there are some question marks yeah we can take the next question so uh, the sure. question is uh, from from mr aregitu he is asking how longs for its conversation after uh, vaccine delivery and proceed to provide the challenge sorry off i could not get the first part of it uh, uh, sir the question is written as how it longs for its conversation after vaccine delivery and proceed to provide the challenge uh, in in animal models he is looking at so if usually the once the antigen is delivered or or vaccine is administered it takes about 10 to 14 days to generate the antibodies in some cases they say you know 7 days and so on but just roughly take a rounded number of 10 to 12 days to see the antibody response and then the second dose if it is required you give another uh, dose of 2 weeks from the first dose and then wait for another 2 weeks so this antibody uh, or the vaccine administration dose schedules are are 2 weeks apart or a 1 month apart uh, in some cases they are they they could be as uh, long as a 6 months uh, apart But, uh, in case if you look at hepatitis a vaccine will be the first dose on day 1 the second dose uh, booster dose is given at 6 uh, months later whereas in case of traditional vaccines or liquid pentavalent vaccines 6 uh, weeks 10 weeks and 14 weeks meaning every 28 days every month apart for for infants so it all depends on the vaccine uh, on the you know how long one has to generate the data on the immune response for their own vaccine formulation and once you know the antibodies are there for that time period then you can proceed for challenge but if there is no human challenge 
uh, there, there, there is, there has been a debate on using uh, humans for vac post vaccination, challenging them with the COVID virus. But that is a lot of uh, ethical uh, issues would come in because there is no way to treat COVID-19. Treat in the sense like a pill or a drug or some kind of antibody to prevent it. That's not fully established yet. So the human challenge trials for COVID-19 are not allowed. They're not ethical at this point. Um, so in animals, you could do it. So you know, that's not a, but again, following your animal ethics committee approvals and so on. The next question is from uh, Mr. Sobhagya from College of Pharmacy, Puri. And his question is, how a model organisms helps in developing a new vaccine? Model organisms. Um, meaning animal model, I think, what she means is, see, um, what we have to say is for, when you test a, a vaccine, you need to see um, when, especially when there are no correlates of protection, meaning certain levels of antibodies, uh, if they are not, uh, um, if, if they are not um, reached or do not indicate you know, protection, and then the only way you have to do is the challenge. So you challenge, that means the animal should be susceptible to the virus, pathogenic virus. And those animals, you vaccinate them first. That's the, this is called an animal model, meaning, uh, First, the disease, does it um, uh, mimic in animals, same as in humans, or the meaning the virus, does the virus cause the same kind of uh, uh, infection in the same animal or, or a selected animal, similar to humans? Once you establish that, then that you would use as a model wherein you vaccinate that animal first and then monitor for antibodies or wait for you know, 28 days or 60 days and then expose that animal to this virus. And then see, the, you'll also have a control group where that control group is not uh, received the vaccine or with something called a placebo without uh, any antigen in it. And then that group is when exposed to the virus, they would, they would not survive 90%. For example, that control group should be susceptible 90% to the viral infection. And then vaccinated group should survive more than 90% uh, compared to the control group. That would set the clear difference between the vaccine and the no vaccine. So that's actually a model, meaning uh, that's a challenge model. If you can identify an animal in which the virus infection is very similar to humans, that itself is that animal you could use as a model for testing your vaccine with the challenge model. Uh, next question from Mr. Mahesh. His question is, uh, since many vaccine developers are making COVID vaccine in a fast mode than, than usual time, so can this be a health problem in future? Um, I see, I read this as, you know, there are some surveys are going on. If the vaccine is developed too fast, uh, how do you know it is good enough? You know? That is not, that should not be a, a negative point. Reason is whether they are developing it fast or not, the, the vaccine, uh, whether the vaccine efficacy is established uh, or not, someone, somebody should you know, be worried about. Meaning they're not cutting corners to, to bypass the safety and efficacy issues that they have to meet in a vaccine clinical trial design these would be built in, <clears throat> meaning a vaccine is approved by the government, it should be safe to, you know, people should feel confident to take it. Uh, that's my you know, personal opinion. Some people have different opinions. That's a different story. Um, but uh, uh, it's, 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 so let me ask something. If you don't want to take the vaccine, you're exposing yourself to the infection. What do you have to lose if the vaccine is safe? That's my question, uh, but different people have different uh, views on that. Uh, 
next question we can take from miss vandita bal she is from jnu and her question is could nucleic acid based vaccines expedite the process for overcoming covid 19 and also is a peptide based vaccine better than a recombinant protein approach um the first part i could not understand uh, the the nucleated vaccine sorry could you, could you repeat yeah, that the, um, the question is could nucleic acid based vaccines mm. fasten the process for overcoming covid 19 yeah i would i would yeah got the two parts in this one is a nucleic acid based vaccine the other is a peptides which one is better so the nucleic acid uh, based vaccine the, there are certain advantages in uh, the ability to manufacture the mrna or a nucleic acid much faster way uh, if the vaccine is approved uh, it could be manufactured uh, very rapidly uh, that's the technology advantage whether it is better than a traditional vaccine i don't know see at this point <clears throat> we do not know which vaccine is uh, better than the other one because there are no approved vaccines at this stage so one has to look at holistically in terms of the efficacy uh, the of the of the vaccine and the ability to manufacture and then make it available uh, the two things have to go together so if you have an you know uh, excellent uh, vaccine but uh, you cannot manufacture or there are a lot of difficulties in manufacturing that means the quality uh, control of the vaccine becomes very, very questionable consistency and robustness ability to manufacture all these things regulatory issues would come into picture uh, so that's the advantage people are taking the nucleic acid is uh, very rapidly you know can be manufactured synthesized in a rapid fashion Uh, if it is better than other vaccines it's a question mark to be still addressed uh, someone is you know other companies are testing it the second part of it you know we are peptides better than the other ones uh, we cannot say that we again it's all data driven we need to look at the data sometimes peptides can they act as a good uh, immunogen yes but again it depends on how you formulate sometimes uh, mixing the peptides with an adjuvant right adjuvant uh it also makes a huge difference so it's not a very straightforward answer it's difficult to draw a conclusion like that but the peptides could be immunogenic yes are they better than traditional vaccines nobody knows you have to generate data on it the next question is from mr mallavika bhomik and question is in case of covid 19 can a patient become reinfected if he or she is not vaccinated yet if yes then is there any enhancement in the immunity of the body in the second infection will the virus show seasonal enhancement or something the question is um it is a difficult to answer the reason is that data is still you know coming up whether a person who recovered from covid infection if uh, he or she could uh, get reinfected some people are saying yes some people are saying no the data is little bit of uh, inconclusive at this point if people uh, if people get exposed a second time uh, the the traditional textbook um, expectation is that would trigger a good antibody response or immune response and then prevent the second infection that's what it is once you are exposed for example if you take a chicken pox vac people the kids who get chicken pox will not get it again um that means they generate a lifelong immunity for first time when they get the disease or uh, chicken pox vaccinated uh, children would not get it because when they get exposed to the virus after the vaccination they trigger a good immune response so the expectation here also second after the recovery from the from the first time infection second time exposure should protect the individual because they already the immune the body already has the memory to trigger a good immune response to the antigens against the virus so um <clears throat> so now since uh, the time 12:30 yeah. has come up so should we uh, proceed so can we take more questions or uh... 
if i i have to you know i have a commitment i have to leave uh, if you, if people could you know uh, if anybody has question they can send it to you you could forward it to me we can you know, answer them as okay sir so then uh, we can uh, um, email you all the questions that are left and all the questions which people have they can email it to me and then we will be sending it to sir so that it can be taken then sure Sure. Okay, sir. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for your enlightening for enlightening talk and informative presentation on vaccines for preventing infectious diseases and challenges in COVID nineteen vaccine development, and your valuable insights enabling us to learn about COVID nineteen and vaccines for COVID nineteen patients. And the slides you have shown us. gave us a closer look at different aspects of developing a vaccine so on behalf of kit technology business incubator kindly accept our sincere thanks thank you thank you all uh thanks for the opportunity thanks for everyone for joining the presentation and your expertise is of great value for the webinar talk and uh, thank you sir and before we close today's enlightening interactive webinar i deeply thank all our participants for joining us today and for their valuable time and we request you to join us for our upcoming webinars and let us all prioritize our health take necessary precautions and negate the impact of covid 19 thank you all thank you